Once in a while, a video comes along that I am itching to debunk. A video that is professionally produced, delivered well, and on the surface seems perfectly reasonable. But buried deep within it lies a web of scientific misunderstandings and pseudoscientific subterfuge. Today on Tim for Tuesday, we're exposing one such video. And we're tearing it to pieces. <laughs> and welcome along to another episode of Tim for Tuesday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Just quickly, a big thank you to the sponsors of this video today, Coopert. More on them at the end of the video. Right, let's get on with it then. And today's video comes from Answers in Genesis, Canada. Apparently, they're going to debunk all the best proofs of evolution in just 12 minutes. Well, the first two minutes are all guff and beans and how the presenter gets it and that he used to mock and laugh at the people trying to debunk evolution. So it's actually really in 10 minutes. They shouldn't be selling themselves short like that. I'll spare you the fluffy intro and we'll get right down to business. Well, in 1859, you might have been presented with Neanderthal man as proof of our evolutionary ancestry even though they'd been found four years earlier and had already been declared fully human by a professional anatomist. However, the release of Darwin's book fueled the search for fossils of imagined ape-like ancestors of man in the evolution-believing community. And lo and behold, four years later, Irish geologist William King decided to re-examine the fossil skull of Neanderthal man and promptly decided that he was an ape-like creature. And many variations of this idea were propagated as science and fact for well over 150 years afterwards. William King's 1864 classification of the Neanderthal man as a separate species was based on distinct anatomical differences, not a rejection of their humanity. He never said explicitly that it was an ape-like species, just not a homo sapien. He actually considered placing it in a different genus, but in the end he classified it as a separate species, Homo neanderthalensis. Today, of course, evolutionists have admitted their true humanity, which is why they're designated as homo, which means human, Neanderthals. And definitive confirmation comes from no less than Dr. Eric Trinkhaus, an evolution-believing paleoanthropologist, considered one of the world's foremost authorities on Neanderthal man, who's concluded, Detailed comparisons of Neanderthal skeletal remains with those of modern humans have shown that there's nothing in Neanderthal anatomy that conclusively indicates locomotor, manipulative, intellectual, or linguistic abilities inferior to those of modern humans. But that does not mean we're the same species. Lions and tigers share similar traits and they can interbreed, but they're different species. Now, obviously, humans evolving into humans isn't exactly proof of evolution. So you can scratch them off the list as Neanderthals certainly aren't proof positive of evolution anymore. That's all well and good, but modern genetics confirms that Neanderthals interbred with Homo sapiens, meaning they were close relatives, but still distinct, consistent with evolutionary theory. And Neanderthals are actually evidence for evolution, not against it. They share many traits with both modern humans and earlier hominins, showing a clear progression in human evolution. Ripping a page out of an evolution book does not debunk it in any way, my friend. Let's move on. However, moving on to 1861, you may have finally found yourself presented with some rock-solid proof in the form of a missing link between dinosaurs and birds, called Archaeopteryx. Good old Archie was used for decades to convince people that a true transitional fossil between lizards and birds had been found. But alas, in 1977, an admitted true bird was found which dates, according to evolutionist methods, at 60 million years older than Archaeopteryx which means Arche couldn't be the transition to birds from lizards if birds already existed. The existence of older bird-like creatures does not disprove that Archaeopteryx was transitional. It simply shows that bird evolution was much more complex than initially thought. Professor John Ostrom of Yale acknowledged, We must now look for the ancestors of flying birds in a period of time much older than that in which Archaeopteryx lived. Please point out for me in that quote from Professor John Ostrom, where he dismisses Archaeopteryx as a transitional fossil. I'll wait. Indeed, far from being some unique dino bird, Arche shared much of its supposed unique anatomical structures with true birds that exist today, 
like the South American Hoatzin, for example. So much for Archaeopteryx as undeniable proof of evolution. Let's take a look at Archaeopteryx next to a modern day bird. There's so many differences here. The three clawed fingers on each wing, similar to small theropod dinosaurs. The small sharp teeth in its jaws. A long bony tail like non-avian dinosaurs. Modern birds have a short fused tailbone. The structure of its hip and its hind limbs resembled those of small theropod dinosaurs, not modern birds. However, it did have feathers and hollow bones and a wishbone, all features of modern day birds. It is quite clear that Archaeopteryx supports the evolution of modern day birds from theropod dinosaurs. And on top of that, bird evolution in general is well documented, with numerous intermediate forms like Microraptor and Confucius Ornus. Now, by 1868, maybe the most cutting edge proof presented to you might have been the supposed shocking similarity of animal and human embryos, and the discovery that humans recapitulated or relived their evolutionary ancestry while developing in the womb. Of course, modern science has shown that the idea that you start off like a worm, then become more like a fish, then become an ape-like creature, and finally a human while growing in your mom, is absolutely ridiculous and would be laughed at by any educated person today. No one ever says that. This is a gross oversimplification and misrepresentation of biology. And Heckel's embryo drawings have now been admitted to being completely fraudulent forgeries made by this supposed great scientist's own hand, and the similarity argument has been shown false as well. And yet they were in textbooks up until my youngest daughter was in school just 15 years ago here in Canada. While Hackle exaggerated his drawings, the core idea of similarities in embryonic development among vertebrates is valid. Modern embryology confirms that early vertebrate embryos share common features, reflecting their shared ancestry. As evolution-believing embryologist Michael Richardson concluded, this is one of the worst cases of scientific fraud. It's shocking to find that somebody once thought was a great scientist was deliberately misleading. It makes me angry. What he, Heckel, did was to take a human embryo and copy it. These are fakes. So obviously these embryo arguments are no longer proof of evolution either. Richardson criticised Heckel's exaggerations, but not the fundamental evidence. And as you said, Richardson knows that evolution is true. All he is doing is showing contempt for one man's actions, not disregarding evolution as a concept. Now, by 1879, you may have felt scientists finally had the proof of evolution, as the American Journal of Science published an impressive diagram showing the supposed evolutionary development of horses which found its way into many other publications and textbooks for years. Now, today, this proof of evolution has been abandoned because of the many severe challenges brought against it. For example, if the series were true, you'd expect to find the earliest fossils in the lowest rock strata, but you don't. In fact, bones of the supposed earliest horses have been found at or near the surface. Sometimes they're found right next to modern horse fossils. This one, is hilarious because horse evolution is one of the best documented fossil sequences in evolutionary science. Transitional horse species like Eohippus, Mesohippus, Pelohippus appear in a logical progression over time. The earliest horse fossils are typically found in Eocene rocks. These date back to around 50 million years. But instead of me listing all of the challenges here, I'll quote the evolutionist curator at the American Museum of Natural History, Dr. Niles Eldridge. I admit that an awful lot of that has gotten into the textbooks as though it were true. For instance, the most famous example still on exhibit downstairs in the American Museum is the exhibit on horse evolution prepared perhaps 50 years ago. That has been presented as literal truth in textbook after textbook. Now I think that's lamentable, particularly because the people who propose these kinds of stories themselves may be aware of the speculative nature of some of the stuff. So obviously the horse evolution series isn't irrefutable proof of evolution either. 
You've taken that Niles Eldridge quote out of context. He was criticising the oversimplified textbook diagrams, not the validity of horse evolution as a whole. Eldridge's critique was directed at the way evolutionary sequences are portrayed, not at the validity of the evolutionary theory itself. He advocated for a more complex and branching understanding of evolution, rather than oversimplified linear models. Why would you take that quote out of context, I wonder? Well, maybe by 1893, they'd show you the good stuff, the so-called scientific evidence of vestigial organs inside of us. These were supposed evidence of useless leftover parts inside us from our supposed evolutionary past. And by this time, evolution-believing scientists like German anatomist Robert Widersham was claiming that our bodies contained over 86 of these useless organs, including the thymus, tonsils, adenoids, valves and veins, the parathyroid, and the pineal and pituitary glands. Of course, not only have all now been shown to be functional, but some have been shown to be critical for life itself. Great. So first off, vestigial does not mean completely useless. It means an organ has lost its original function or been repurposed. And just because some of those structures have now been proven to be useful and are required, that does not rule out the existence of vestigial organs as a rule, does it? Today's doctors would consider that old list laughable. And over the years, the list of so-called vestigial organs has shrunk to a handful of highly questionable examples, even within the evolutionary community itself. Even the most commonly touted of all, the appendix, is now recognized as a highly specialized organ with a rich blood supply that manufactures several types of antibodies. It's not some useless relic. The appendix, whilst having some immune functions, is still a vestigal structure. It was once crucial for digesting plant material in herbivorous ancestors, but it's no longer essential. Otherwise, you wouldn't have it removed if it starts playing up, would you? And it's not just the fact that these vestigial organ claims kept getting knocked off the list. It's the fact that the whole concept itself is a terrible proof of evolution to begin with. Well, it's not, because examples of vestigial structures still remain, such as human tailbones or wisdom teeth, or the reduced hind limbs of whales. The whale example, I think, is a home run. Mammal with ancient structures in their bodies that would have been used when their ancestors were walking on land. How else would you explain that? Ultimately, evolution is about how supposedly new structures, forms, functions, and features came to exist, not about the degeneration of existing structures over time. Something that used to have a function, but no longer does, is no direct help to the story of evolution. So these once great proofs of evolution have ended up in the dustbin as well. This argument actually confuses me. Kent Hovind says it too. Losing something does not mean that evolution and natural selection is not a thing. Losing something still means that an animal is adapting to its environment. Let's look at the case of those hind limbs in Wales and how natural selection works here. Think of when that mammal ancestor first entered the water. Those ancestors that were born with smaller rear legs swam better and hence survived more. Now, by 1912, you'd finally have been shown some truly dynamic fossil evidence found in a gravel pit near Piltdown in England. The skull of an ancient ape man dubbed Piltdown Man was presented as overwhelming proof of our evolutionary ancestry. And for 40 years, this supposed proof was displayed in museum exhibits and textbooks as proof positive that human beings had descended from ape-like ancestors with hand-drawn scientific images of what the creature must have looked like. But once again, four decades later, the evidence was re-examined and revealed as a fraud. Yes, by scientists using improved methods, not creationists. Evolutionary science corrected itself. Frauds and mistakes exist in all fields of science. But self-correction is a strength, not a weakness. It wasn't even a good fraud as you could easily see how the teeth from a jawbone had been filed down to make them look more human, and the bones had been chemically treated to make them look very old. It was simply a combination of an old human skull and a modern ape jawbone stuck together. So much for that proof of evolution. It was never good proof anyway. There are still many genuine hominin fossils, like Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, all providing robust proof. Yet, you aren't even talking about them. But wait, 
by 1917, just five years later in the U.S., they found some powerful evidence for evolution when a Nebraskan rancher found what he thought was a special kind of tooth on his farm. And an evolution-believing paleontologist friend of his was excited at the prospect it must have come from an ape man. And after an artist applied a healthy helping of evolutionary imagination to his picture, he produced a portrait of Nebraska Man, a hairy ape man, along with his ape woman wife in a scientific journal. And this was touted as great scientific proof for evolution. Nebraska Man? Really? Nebraska Man was another mistake, and it was quickly corrected. Scientists re-examined the fossil and determined that it belonged to a pig-like mammal, not a human. Again, this is an example of science working as it should. Self-correcting errors when new evidence emerges. One mistake does not invalidate an entire branch of science. Well, I'll tell you what, I've never seen such a poor attempt at debunking evolution in my life. Most of your examples were things that have since been corrected. Where is your debunking of genetics or observed special events or artificial selection? It seems quite clear to me that you've selected the weakest of arguments and then claimed you've debunked evolution. But all you've done is expose your absolute desperation at trying to prove evolution wrong. And you failed. I think you need to come back and have a better go, my friend. And what's hilarious is, the cherry on the cake is this presenter has blue eyes. He shares a common ancestor with all blue-eyed people on Earth. Six to 10,000 years ago, a single individual had a mutation that caused blue eyes. We know this because we've studied mitochondrial DNA. You are a walking example of evidence of evolution, yet you sit there trying to debunk it. The irony is palpable. Well, there do we go, everyone. What did you think of that one? Good? Did you like it? Let me know in the comments below what you thought and what you thought of uh, our blue-eyed friend's arguments. As I say, we're all done and dusted for another Tim Ford Tuesday. Thank you so much for watching. It is very much appreciated. If you enjoyed it, please do give the video a big thumbs up and subscribe as well for more of the same. Now, let me tell you a bit more about today's sponsor, Coopert. Coopert is a free extension designed to help users save money effortlessly while shopping online. It supports Chrome, Edge, Opera, Firefox, and Safari, and with over 8 million active users. Coopert serves over 200,000 merchants globally. Now, they offer three core services, automatic coupon testing, cashback rewards, and a price comparison service. All you have to do is install Coopert into your browser then, when you're doing your shopping and you're at checkout, Coopert will find all the voucher codes for you and then apply them to your basket. Here I am having a shop for a new globe. Uh, I've selected the one I want, I've put it into the, uh, the basket, and lo and behold, I've got some coupon savings. Absolutely fantastic. Happy days. You'll be saving money too in no time. Check out the link in the description where you can download Coopert now. Thank you very much again for them for sponsoring today's video. I've been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great day. I'll see you on Thursday for another comments video special. See you then. Bye bye.